So as long as we're on the topic of kind of government role in, in thinking about risk, I want to talk about uh, uh, pharmaceutical cost, especially in this world of, uh, you know, civility and specialty drugs and genomics and individual medicine and thinking also about uh, advances in technology when you have to sort of project the future and don't necessarily know sort of what's coming down the pike or uh, what it will be priced at or exactly what the demand is. Um, some people would argue that there may be a, an additional role for, you know, say the FDA or others to kind of get involved uh, with drug pricing. Uh, any, any thoughts on that? Well, the, um, uh, a, a, a couple, and, and, and I'll go back to principles around transference of risk and what makes sense for both the patient as well as as as, as the physicians. Um, when, when in the early days of designing uh, bundle payment programs, uh, this issue came to the forefront because you're looking at historical past in order to project a budget and, and create the financial risk around uh, that defined episode. But then, so you, you take an episode like uh, hepatitis C, um, and uh, if, if the past were to be used as the budget for the future, um, every single physician managing a patient with hepatitis C uh, would go bankrupt right. or would deny the proven um, uh, treatment that actually cures the problem. So it, it, it's it, the, the, the the policy that um, we developed early on was to say, when you have a therapy that comes on the market that has a proven efficacy, and we can discuss you know, what the what that means, um, you, you give them a mulligan. So in other words, you you ignore the effect of that particular therapy or that particular treatment on the pre-calculated budget. So it's kind of a safe harbor that says, look, um, we're going to let it play out because we don't want to restrict care uh, when there's a, a proven effectiveness of a, of a given therapy. Um, and we know that the budget's wrong. <laughs> because it could never account for that new treatment. Now, you know, we're talking here about treatments that have an inflation factor on a budget. There are also treatments that could have a deflate, uh, deflating factor on. And so you're going to have it wrong in, 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 uh, in, in both directions, but I think it's okay right? because you want to, in fact, encourage uh, the development of treatments that are going to have a deflating um, uh, a factor on the budget, and then you want to create a safe harbor, I think, around the ones that um, uh, are going to inflate it for the right reasons, not for the right. wrong you know, drug costs are going to be a challenge for every delivery system, for every physician, because ultimately it's the physician who writes that prescription, for the health care, uh, health plans, uh, for employers, and for anybody who pays taxes, because our tax dollars pay for a lot of this too. Um, there are so many medications that are out there now that are truly miracle drugs. They're diseases that a few years back were terminal. Take HIV, for example. When I was in training, everybody with HIV died. Now it's a chronic disease, and it's managed with medications. The same is true of a lot of leukemias and lymphomas and other oncologic problems. And then you look at multiple sclerosis and other uh, non-oncologic problems. There are medications that have been developed to manage those people. So diseases that were previously terminal are now manageable, but the medications are very expensive and they're used for year after year after year. So as a society, this is one of those things, what cost is society willing to pay for those things? Uh, and that's a challenge for the health plans, but it's a challenge for everybody. Not only that, when we have a tiered system where tier one would be, say, generic medications, well, there are instances now where the generic medications are priced above the, the name brand. There are instances where the pricing of a medication changes three, four, five times in a given year. So it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, and I'm not here taking pot shots at, uh, at Big Pharma. As I said, some of what has been created is truly miraculous. On the other hand, uh, there are instances where the research and development budgets are less than the advertising budgets. Um, so there's a, a controversial subject for you. <laughs> are you limited at all the hepatitis C drugs within your patient population in any way? No. And how much of a hit is it going to mean for your bottom line? It's a huge hit. It's a huge hit. And it's something that wasn't originally budgeted. 
Uh, it's very expensive, but it's, it's the right thing to do. These, there was no treatment for people with hepatitis C previously, and now there is. How can you deny them that care? But on the other hand, it's expensive. And that's just one, one example. Don't forget, right now in phase two and phase three development of medications, there are somewhere between two and 300 medications that are going to be put out in the marketplace with average costs of about $50,000 a year or more. So whereas medications used to be about 15% of the premium dollar, now it's closer to 20% and that's going to go up. And as it does, something else has to come down. Yeah. Otherwise, you're never going to reduce the cost of health care. You're trying to bend the curve so it does, doesn't go up huge, as fast. Huge challenge for the it's future. A huge challenge. Anybody want to go on record in talking about price regulation? Yeah, I'll do it because. <laughs> <laughs> that keeps off the hook. Um, uh, because it's the, you know, again, the U.S. is the only country that doesn't do this, as you know, Dennis. And um, when you are faced with uh, the introduction of, of uh, new treatments and therapies um, that, in some instances, only improve, they don't even improve, um, they extend life by a few months, uh, but at a price that is incredibly high. Um, if the family wants to pay for it, that's fine. Uh, you know, the notion that um, uh, uh, taxes should pay for it or premiums should pay for it uh, always is, doesn't make a huge amount of sense. Um, and in most other countries, you end up with price regulation on, 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 on some of these um, so that you at least have a ceiling. And, um, uh, and without that, you know, the, the, it's not a question of putting a price on life. It's a question of uh, creating a price point, which becomes a ceiling, um, uh, and then under which all kinds of negotiations in the private sector can go on. Uh, but without that ceiling, you end up with really silly right. uh, type of uh, effects. And let's not forget the prior discussion around Medicare, Medicaid expansion, you know, Medicaid expansion. So you've got states turning a blind eye on people who can't afford health care. Uh, we're all trying to do our best to manage affordability. And uh, if all that is wasted because uh, there's a lack of, of political willingness to put a ceiling on the price of certain treatments or therapies, then what's the point? Right. Well, certainly uh, 